Search warrants served on big tech companies in the Idaho 4 murder case. What could police be looking for and why? Welcome to Law & Crime Sidebar Podcast. I'm Anjanette Levy. 28-year-old Brian Koberger has pleaded not guilty to murdering four University of Idaho students in their off-campus home last November. Koberger was a student at Washington State University not far from the scene of the murders. Police found the sheath of a K-bar knife underneath one of the victims, Maddie Mogan, but to our knowledge, a murder weapon has not been found. Since March of this year, Moscow police have served several search warrants on social media companies, banks, and even the K-bar knife company. But the records are heavily redacted, and the warrants are sealed. The latest documents show in July, detectives seized records for Apple, Amazon, PayPal, Venmo, Google, and YouTube. Also, they seized records for Spotify. But we don't know whose accounts they wanted. We do know the Amazon warrant asked for the click history of the account owner. The warrant to Apple sought messages and anything saved to an iCloud account. And the PayPal and Venmo warrants were looking for financial information like transactions, billing info, geolocation data, and any emails or phone numbers that might be connected to the account. Koberger waived his right to a speedy trial in August, which means the trial is postponed indefinitely. Joining me to discuss these latest search warrants in the Idaho 4 case is somebody who is very familiar with evidence because he teaches it at the Beasley School of Law at Temple University. He is Professor Jules Epstein. Welcome back to Sidebar. Thanks for coming back. Thank you for having me. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, tell me if you would, Jules, what does this tell you that just in the past two months or so, this, this trial was initially scheduled for October. It was initially scheduled to begin today, in fact, with jury selection. And back in July, they are sending out all of these search warrants. We don't know who they're for, whose accounts, but it was for Spotify, Apple, Amazon, Google, YouTube. At PayPal, Venmo. What does this tell you? It, well, this is reading tea leaves, but it suggests a bunch of possible concerns. And number one, this is a death penalty case. And prosecutors have to be and want to be at their most thorough in a death penalty case. And right now, while the evidence is compelling, it's also largely circumstantial. His car or a car just like it's seen near there. His cell phone indicating travel in that area repeatedly. Um, of course, there's the DNA on the knife sheath. Whether that's enough for a jury to convict and give the death penalty is anybody's guess. Um, many jurors or prospective jurors in death penalty cases have said, Forget about beyond a reasonable doubt. I will never vote for the death penalty unless it's beyond all doubt. So one explanation is this is the prosecutor trying to cement their case. Another is they're doing just what good prosecutors and police do, keep investigating. Um, and coincidentally, by keeping investigating, that adds or potentially adds to the arsenal of evidence that they have. One thing that I kind of, this is what came to mind for me when I saw this. So this is a death penalty case. It was initially scheduled to begin on October 2nd with jury selection because Koberger had asserted his right to a speedy trial. He later waived that right to a speedy trial because it appeared that both sides, both the prosecution and the defense were not ready to do this. I mean, this is a case with a voluminous amount of evidence why are we requesting, if they, we don't know if they're for Brian Koberger, they could be for maybe an alternative suspect. We just don't know. Um, or one of the kids involved in this, but we, we don't know. Why are we requesting this stuff so late in the game if we were, you know, looking toward trial in October? Shouldn't these have been things that possibly had been, they were, should have been requested much earlier? I don't know why it took people time to initiate these requests, um, if I understand it correctly, they already have the results. So yes. in theory, they could have been ready for today had the case been going. Um, again, it may have been 
somebody said, oops, we never checked that. It may have been they got lead number one that made them think, oh, now we need to follow up. It may have been that they stumbled on an account of Kohlberger's that they weren't aware existed, and that triggered the thought. Um, sometimes there's also a process. When you are requesting, when you, I mean, in other words, when police or prosecutors are requesting information from uh, social media, from Google, things of that nature, it takes a while to get it. Um, I don't know all the policies. They may have had issues of having to notify the customer, quote unquote. Um, so. I don't want to say they were late. I can't tell. Uh, and that's true. We don't know. And we can't tell because everything of substance is redacted. Right. One thing we can tell, though, is that they subpoenaed or, you know, or issued a search warrant for records of somebody's Amazon account. Amazon sells just about everything under the sun. You can get anything on Amazon. And they're looking to see what pages a person may have been on in their account, that type of thing. Um, you know, earlier in the year, there's been a lot of talk of, well, did he, did the suspect own this K-Bar knife? And earlier in the year, in March, I believe, they had subpoenaed K-Bar knives for records because obviously they had a K-Bar knife sheath found at the scene under Maddie Mogan's body. So they're very interested, obviously, in in somebody's purchase history or browsing history on Amazon. Right, and the knife, which has never been recovered, right, is the missing link. Again, I'm not saying there is or is not enough to convict, but certainly if you can put a knife into the defendant's hand or a search for that kind of knife into the defendant's search history, um, that's going to add a lot to the case. And I should add here, nobody has a right to object to a search warrant directed to Amazon. We don't own that private information um, under United States Supreme Court case law when you give information to a third party, you share your credit card, you make purchases, and they keep that um, information, it's not yours. And so there is no absolute privacy interest where you can say, hey, my, my rights were violated when you searched my Amazon account. It's just not there. PayPal and Venmo, they're obviously looking for transactions uh, by somebody. Um, we don't know, you know, we're kind of speculating here. We're doing a lot of speculating, uh, but they had subpoenaed and issued search warrants for, we believe the victims, Venmo and uh, PayPal accounts earlier in the year, a, a whole slew of search warrants went out. So they're looking obviously for payments you can also go on Venmo and basically look other people up and see who they've paid. So maybe they're also using these records to see, did this person look up, per, did, did person Y look up person X, that type of thing? Do you think that that's part of this process possibly as well, Jules? I'm, I'll be guessing. But the answer is, this is the well-known leave no stone unturned. Certainly, if they could find a link of any sort between one of the victims and the defendant, that would be incredibly powerful. Um, otherwise, they are just checking a lot of information. Maybe there's one other reason. The defense in any criminal case can often raise questions about the adequacy or completeness of the police investigation. Well, you didn't look here and you didn't look there and you didn't check and alternate suspects and things of that nature. Um, one added value of this exhaustive search process is to say we did check. 
and there's nobody else out there. Let's move on to the touch DNA. Uh, touch DNA, a lot of people would say is unreliable. And it sounds like uh, from what we know, and, and, and we really know very little, we, we know what was in the affidavit of probable cause to arrest Brian Koberger uh, late last year. Is touch DNA, in your opinion, Jules, as unreliable or potentially unreliable as some people claim it is? So it's, it's weird for me to hear the term unreliable with touch DNA. The DNA is the DNA. The reliability, if you will, is how did it get there? So right now, I'm, let's do this. I'm touching this item, okay? I'm touching an item in my office. There's the camera. There we go. Okay. Clearly, my DNA is on it. And if I hand this to you and you put it in your pocket, possibly my DNA may now be on your clothes. So that if my DNA ends up on your clothes, did I touch you or did you get it from putting this thing in your pocket? Well, that's a great question. If there's an innocent explanation for how I touched something that something else touched or whatever that got my DNA. So that if I went to a knife store and picked up a knife sheath, it would have my DNA, but then I put the knife down and didn't buy it. Um, at the end of the day, it's his DNA. And the question is, sure, you can say, well, it was touched somewhere else. Okay, where else? Or what else? Or what was there that could contaminate it by two things touching? I have no idea what the defense theory or fact is on that. So I, I get the idea about touch DNA, but until there's a context that says, my goodness, there is a way that somehow something with his DNA, his own hand, or another item touched that sheath, all we have is his DNA on the sheath. There have been a lot of uh, people saying online, and I, I, I'm saying defense attorneys, they'll say, well, the touch DNA could, be, could have been transferred. You know, you could have shook somebody, shaken somebody's hand, or you could have done this or that, and it could have been transferred that way. But your DNA is still, as you said, on a knife sheath found under a murder victim's body. So, so again, if there, like I said, if we could prove that that knife sheath was in Joe or Sally or whoever's hardware store, and that the defendant worked in that hardware store, that might be an explanation. If we could prove that it was in the hardware store next to the hammers, and he went over to reach for a hammer, that would be an interesting explanation. Everybody's right that yes, my DNA on item X does not automatically mean that I held it. But it doesn't mean that I didn't. You need a context. One of the search warrants we forgot to mention was for Google and YouTube. Uh, YouTube is owned by Google. So this could be for any number of things. Um, you know, emails, possibly, a YouTube account. What could that tell us, if anything? Very often, um, police are looking for searches both before a crime and after. Um, before a crime, it's, what were you looking up? I mean, in this guy's past, if I understand it correctly, as a um, students studying criminology, he did some sort of study with offenders where he asked them a question along the lines of, um, how did you either pick your victim or approach your victim? Something like that. Okay. Well, that's interesting. Whether his research on that would be admissible at trial is a question that could be argued both ways. But suppose he was doing research like that online before the crime. 
Suppose he did a Google Earth, Google Maps, check out that house before the crime. That would be incredibly powerful. After the crime, it could be anything from how often did he read stories about the case? If there is this peculiar obsession with it, um, prosecutors have argued that that shows what we call consciousness of guilt. Was he looking at states, uh, countries that have no extradition treaty? Was he looking at alternative explanations for how my DNA got somewhere? Um, when people search, their searches are sometimes just curiosity um, and sometimes reflect a concern. So it's either planning or concern. Brian Koberger has now waived his right to a speedy trial. When do you see this case going to trial? Uh, what, would you see it? Is 2024 a possibility or do we think it could go out farther than that? Death penalty cases are different because they're really two trials. You have the trial on guilt or non-guilt. Then you have an entire second trial on punishment. Um, as much as we are focusing on the investigation into the who did it, the lawyers need to also be focusing on the investigation into every aspect of his life mm -hmm. and looking for any possible what we call mitigation evidence, evidence that would argue for a sentence less than death. That takes a lot of time. Mm -hmm. It takes a lot of money. Having said that, I don't know right now why it couldn't go to trial in the next year. Well, Professor Jules Epstein, we appreciate your time and your expertise as always. It's always a pleasure. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for all the in-depth coverage you provide. It's really great. Oh, thank you. That's it for this edition of Law & Crime Sidebar Podcast. You can listen to and download Sidebar on Apple, Spotify, Google, and wherever else you get your podcasts. And of course, you can always watch it on Law & Crime's YouTube channel. I'm Anjanette Levy, and we will see you next time.